Thank you, David. I appreciate the opportunity and good morning, everyone. So we will be talking about lower risk MDS in patients who failed erythropoietin stimulating agents and actually do not have deletion 5Q. I have no disclosures that are relevant to this. We'll talk about areas where there's some data and maybe less data in terms of this patient population. So as always, I like to think back to the patient in front of us. And I think in lower risk MDS, there's a lot of area for interpretation in this particular realm. Always we're hoping to improve marrow function, but I think the main goal for most of us when we see these patients is to decrease their transfusion needs. And really that's because that in decreases the impact of their diagnosis on their quality of life. Coming into the clinic weekly, monthly, what have you, may really um, pose a problem for them in terms of their disease. Establishment of a careful monitoring plan I think is also very helpful in these patients um, in order to figure out uh, how they can manage their disease. And then as always, we hope that we lower any transformation to AML risk, but this is less prevalent in this lower risk population. So in terms of the current treatment paradigm, and I'll mention that we are speaking about lower risk MDS, and these are patients with low or intermediate one IPSS scores. That's a score of less than one, or a score of less than four on the more recent revised IPSS. And I think there's a lot of different ways that people think about this, but this is how I think about the patients when I see them. And certainly in the context of asymptomatic cytopenias, it is very permissible to observe and follow the CBC until these patients really need therapy. In terms of the symptomatic cytopenias in patients that don't have deletion 5Q, we really have to figure out where we should focus our efforts, and this is usually directed at which cell line is down the most. Today I'll spend most of my efforts speaking about patients um, uh, in the anemic category, as the title was requested that we talk about patients who have uh, lost their response or failed erythropoietin stimulating agents. But we will briefly touch on thrombocytopenic as well as pancytopenic patients, and there's a lot of options as we go through. So it's always helpful, I think, in my own head to help define for patients as well as myself as a clinician who is truly refractory to erythropoietin stimulating agents. And different people view this differently. Uh, but there is some data to suggest how we should go with it. And the majority of patients who are going to respond to these agents do um, have their response within about an eight to 12 week window. And it has been shown in some good uh, both retrospective studies and occasional perspective look that fixed dose versus weight-based programs um, of EPO are beneficial. And so I would encourage you to treat your patients in this fashion on a weekly or Q2 weekly or even Q3 weekly basis. And the median duration of response for patients to these erythropoietin stimulating agents is usually around two years. And we do know that some predictors of better response is if their erythropoietin agent, or excuse me, the erythropoietin level was less than 500. Um, and so I do always encourage checking it um, as early as you can in their process. Um, an IPS lower risk or intermediate one, so patients who are doing better, if their blasts are less than 5%, and patients who fall into the category of refractory anemia or refractory anemia with ring sitter blasts, those patients who don't have multilineage dysplasia. And a cautionary note is it is worthwhile if you think someone's losing their response to check iron studies in these patients um, because if you think they're losing their response or they're quote, un, quote unquote relapsing, it may be just that they need a little bit of an iron boost uh, to make better use of the erythropoietin stimulating agent. And an early ESA failure is design, defined as someone who has no response or has relapsed at less than six months. So let's first talk about lenalidomide. I think this is where most people tend to go as a next step after the erythropoietin stimulating agents. We do have some data here, both older and newer. So there's a phase study of 215 patients, and those who were eligible were these lower risk patients we've been referring to. And all of these patients had transfusion dependent anemia. And this was defined as greater than two units in the previous two months prior to enrollment on the study. And the patients were required to be off growth factors at the time of enrollment. And they were given um, linamilidomide in the schedules that we're familiar with, either 28 days or 21 out of 28 days at a 10 milligram dose. And it was noted certainly that cytopenias, usually thrombocytopenia, can be limiting um, in using linalidomide in this patient population. But if you look, and this is what we've been quoting patients pretty much since this study was published um, in the late 2000s, that you'll see somewhere between uh, 20 and 30 percent response rate with red cell transfusion independence when you use lenalidomide in the non-Del5Q population. 
and the median duration of response was 41 weeks. And this is what we've been saying for quite some time, but I find it useful at the most recent ASH meeting that the results of a phase three study, which was predominantly conducted in Europe, and this has a lot to do with the way ESAs and other medications have achieved regulatory approval in Europe versus the United States, but this was a placebo-controlled study, I think would have been hard to be done predominantly in the U.S., but they randomized patients with lower risk non-DEL 5Q MDS um, to 10 milligrams daily or placebo, and it was a two-to-one randomization. And these are the results that were presented by Dr. Santini at the most recent ASH meeting. The patient population was exactly as we're probably seeing in our clinics. They were a little bit older, at 71 years, but there was quite a range. And the majority of these patients had had prior therapies, many multiple lines, but this almost always included an erythropoietin-stimulating agent. And the response was very confirmatory of what had been seen in that earlier Raza paper, um, that um, greater than 56 days of red cell transfusion independence was seen in about 27% of the lenalidomide treated arm compared to only 2.5% of the placebo arm. And you could say, well, this was just confirmatory of what we already know, but the way I couched this to patients and I find it helpful is they had a few other metrics. That of those patients that responded, 90% of those patients responded in 16 weeks, and that would be four cycles. And so I use this as a gauge for our patients when we're plotting out our therapeutic plan, that if they haven't responded in that time, then I think we're going to move forward and say it it didn't work for us. And I think patients find that very helpful um, so that they can plot out plan A, plan B, and so forth. And the median duration of response had a fairly uh, wide range there, as you can see. Um, from 20 to 71 months, and that's something that's a little bit harder to predict on the individual level. The toxicities were not so bad in this group. The adverse events were some myelodepression with grade 3 to 4 neutropenia, and that was obviously much higher in the lenalidomide-treated group compared to the placebo. And then, again, the thrombocytopenia that I mentioned as well. There were, I think, a fair number of discontinuations, but reasonable for the um, patients that were treated. So moving forward after lenalidomide, we always go to other approved agents. And so this, of course, is the hypomethylating um, group of uh, treatments, azacitidine or decitabine. And this is usually second line in anemic lower risk patients. And they may be less effective in the um, ESA resistant patients. And I'll just tell a cautionary tale from my own recent uh, clinic consultations. I saw a delightful gentleman in his 90s. He had been on erythropoietin stimulating agents for about two and a half years. Um, so exactly in the median, he had responded well initially, and he had recently become transfusion uh, dependent again. And he very much loved to travel, and so this was quite a hindrance of his quality of life. He argued quite strongly to his treating provider that he wanted to be aggressive, despite his possibly advanced age. And in that context, he was placed on a hypomethylating agent, azacitidine. And on one of the schedules, I'll show you. But unfortunately, he had been admitted two times in the um, first cycle of his hypomethylating agent uh, for febrile neutropenia. And so I always think we should be careful moving to this in terms of not wanting to harm the patient. And I bring up this story because in taking his social history, it turned out he was a veteran of the Battle of the Bulge. And I thought, oh my goodness, if the Battle of the Bulge didn't get him, we don't want to use our hypomethylating agents in this regard to... Um, cause him further harm. So I would be careful here. It's not unreasonable in the lower risk MDS population to consider hypomethylating agents if they have profound other cytopenias, not just the uh, refractory anemia, and it's something that probably should be discussed early on with patients. The response rates are quite variable. They're from 30 to 60 percent. So this isn't bad, and it's about how we do in terms of this group of patients. There's a lot of different schedules, and this is a fairly common question I feel that I get in consultation, and there's no purported right or wrong here. Um, The standard which we all think about is 75 milligrams per meter squared per day for seven days or five days, and this has been looked at in a larger number of patients systematically, both by Dr. Kamraji at his group uh, at Moffitt and others, and the response rate that was reported um, in this particular group of patients was 61%. Other schedules are laid out for us here, and I think um, you could support pretty much whatever schedule you wanted to give with some data out there, and 
be able to quote the patient a particular range of response um, from that 30 to 60 percent range. In terms of azacitidine, and then the same with decitabine, though perhaps this 30 percent would suggest it's a little bit lower in that particular patient group. So then what happens in these low-risk patients, they've been through their erythropoietin-stimulating agent, they've passed through uh, the linalidomide, and then they've passed through um, a hypomethylating agent. And this is really a problem, I think, for our patients. Um, uh, Probet and all uh, in 2013 published in Hematologica um, a retrospective look at 59 patients who'd been treated both on trial as well as with compassionate use. And this is out of Europe where uh, hypomethylating agents are not approved for low-risk MDS. And the duration of the patient's MDS prior to looking at how they did after azacitidine was 13 months. And the majority, 81% of the patients, were transfusion dependent at the time that we looked. And what this group showed was that there was approximately a 42% response rate. And how response was defined in these patients we could talk about for a long time. But predominantly, it was 15 major hematologic improvements, three PRs and seven CRs. And that's about what you'd see in a very real world experience. And the patient's survival after the initiation of azacitidine was almost 17 months. So not great, but it is something. And you can see the obligatory Kaplan-Meier curves here that show how these patients do. A more recent uh, publication from the MDS Clinical Research Consortium here in the United States, again looking at this real world experience of how our patients do in terms of um, post aza failure, especially the lower risk group, looked at about 438 patients, and 77% of them were really truly meeting criteria for lower risk disease at the time of the initiation of either the azacitidine or the decitabine. And what this again showed was a 35% response rate um, after a median of six cycles, so truly treating them through six cycles and reevaluating. But the median response was fairly low um, in terms of duration at seven months, and this is something to discuss with your patients of what we're going to get out of this. So then what can you do that's available and possibly easy to do um, in patients who have failed and what you can look for going forward? So there was a phase three. Um, uh, show, looking at immunosuppression in this particular group of patients of lower risk MDS. You could use ATG and cyclosporin, sort of a hypoplastic or a plastic anemia type regimen compared to best supportive care. And they looked at 88 patients with lower risk MDS. A CR or PR in about 30% of the treated arm compared to only 10% in the best supportive care arm. But this isn't something we tend to move towards in practice very regularly because it's, it's onerous and it can come with its own toxicities. But I do think about it in patients who may have had some of the predictors of response that was looked at in this particular trial. A little bit younger patients, patients who either had a normal karyotype or a trisomy 8, patients who had HLA-DR15 positivity, Again, the hypocellularity, which I think is where people are most familiar with this treatment paradigm. And then patients who had evidence of a positive PNH clone, which might suggest more of an Im immune type phenotype to their disease. But nonetheless, if you really look at these curves, and this is what you're often going to see in this particular group of patients as we move forward, uh, that the outcomes were modest, oops, excuse me, uh, modest at best. And now, before I move into more investigational agents that have been looked at recently, I just want to talk about one particular pearl that shouldn't be uh, forgotten in this particular group. So they're not getting any benefit of their ESAs. They've started to get the red cell transfusions again. And don't forget to think about iron chelation in this patient population because I think it's a very reasonable set of therapies to discuss with them that could be considered supportive care outside of the aggression treatment paradigm that might help them. And so if they have ongoing transfusion dependence, there's some retrospective data that suggests there is a benefit to iron chelation. I will be very frank, though. There's no prospective data, and I, I share this with patients. There's a study ongoing in the prospective fashion that's accrued very slowly here um, called the Telesto study and is hoping to show some direct positive effects of chelation on hematopoiesis. And I think that biologically there's a lot of reasons to suggest this is true. And in my patients, I often start it when the ferritin's over about 2,500 or after about 50 units of red cells, depending how they're doing. And in the occasional patient that I do obtain a cardiac T2 MRI, 
on if they do have abnormal findings, I think that's very good justification to subject him to these medicines, which do have some inherent toxicities, GI mainly, that makes patients dislike taking them. But it's really an important discussion to have to them if the paradigm um, is offering them ongoing transfusional support, which is not unreasonable. So let's move forward and talk about investigational agents. So one that was looked at uh, at the NHLBI and CI a few years ago was alemtuzumab. And I'm actually surprised at how many patients I see in uh, consultation that have actually had this even still more recently. So it's alemtuzumab. It's given for 10 days. The primary endpoints of the study were to look at hematologic responses. This was exactly the patient population that we've been discussing, the lower risk MDS who had lost their erythropoietin stimulating agent response. And they did say that 17 out of 22 of those patients had sustained hemoglobin increases, and they quoted some cytogenetic remissions. There was no clear impact on survival, though, and this is a hard medicine to give. It's a hard medicine to take, and the longstanding cytopenias and other issues with it make it something that I personally don't move towards at all uh, in this patient population. Another uh, medication that was looked at in clinical trials only was siltuximab. Um, it's a monoclonal antibody um, against anti-IL-6. Biologically in the lab, this seemed like it could be quite promising um, because the goal is to control the anemia of inflammation that's associated with MDS. And I think a lot of us do have a flavor that for our patients, this um, inflammatory series of steps in the hematopoietic pathway could be modified and benefit like this. This was a double-blinded, placebo-controlled phase two, and it's really done for safety and efficacy only. It was randomized two to one um, with the drug versus best supportive care, and the patients got therapy for 12 weeks, which I do think was a reasonable biologic amount of time to see if you could control inflammation for anemia. And unfortunately, this study was terminated early due to lack of e efficacy. I use this as an illustrative example because there's many studies that I could go forward talking to you about all morning for agents in this particular group of patients um, where there wasn't a lot of benefit in terms of the investigational therapy. But that's not meant to be negative. It's just to tell you that we really do need more agents and more patients studied to see if we can have a benefit. And one more happy study has um, not been published, but I'll mention two abstracts for a type of um, agent that I think is quite promising. And these are the type 2A receptor fusion proteins. This is a um, type of drug that has a very different mechanism than our erythropoietin-stimulating agents. It acts on late-stage erythropoiesis uh, with the goal of increasing mature red blood cells in the circulation, which is really what our patients need. So the drug is called Lucepatercept in Europe, and there's an ongoing study with that, and there's an analogous USA study um, called Sotatercept. Um, we'll speak specifically about the Lucepatercept, though the uh, data for Sotatercept is quite similar. So it's a phase two, multi-center, open-label dose-finding study being conducted in Europe. It is ongoing, and these results, um, Dr. Platzbecker presented at um, ASH this past December and was good enough to share his slides with me. The patients who are eligible were these um, ESA refractory patients. They did have erythropoietin levels greater than 500, and they had lost their response or were never responsive to the ESA. And in this particular case, and I think this is interesting and probably clinically relevant, is these patients had not seen hypomethylating agents or lenalidomide prior to enrollment on this study. The primary endpoints were for efficacy, and they did stratify the patients in their analysis for low transfusion burden patients versus high transfusion burden patients. I think our patients might feel differently about how that was defined, but it, you can see how they defined it in the study here. Erythroid response was achieved in 41% of patients who were treated at a fairly low dose. And I think this is a promising agent, and these probably are going to go forward as more data comes out from these trials. And I think this is the most enthusiasm that we've seen for a particular set of agents. And it's partly because it's a biologically distinct mechanism, but also uh, they're fairly benign without many adverse events. I will make a note, because I think this is the other thing that you're going to start seeing in lower-risk MDS patients, is they're starting to look more at some of these molecular profilings for our patients in terms of who might be more likely to respond to these. And in this particular cohort from Europe, those patients who had SF3B1 mutations, which is highly characteristic of refractory anemia of the ring blasts, were more likely to respond than those did not.
So let's move forward to how other agents can help in terms of other cytopenias. So uh, a lot of interest, especially in aplastic anemia and thrombopoietin receptor agonists. We heard a little bit about these this morning in some other context. But in particular to lower risk MDS, these have been looked at as well. Um, specifically, um, the romiplostin platelets less than 50,000 is seen in about 30% of lower risk MDS patients if you look through the literature. And currently, I really will caution, these are only approved for use with immune cytopenias. And I try to avoid their use outside of clinical trials if I can um, for a few reasons. So there was a randomized phase two of 250 patients. There was a two to one randomization of romiplostin versus the placebo, and they were given it for 58 weeks. It did clearly increase platelet counts, and it did clearly decrease the number of bleeding events and tra platelet transfusions. However, this study, as you may recall, was stopped early, and it was because there was concern for increased blasts as well as evolution to acute myeloid leukemia. And the hazard ratio for that at the time it was stopped was um, 2.5, which really does give us all pause. However, this was recently published uh, towards the end of last year, and in longer-term follow-up, it did show that there was no impact on overall survival, and the hazard ratio, though the confidence interval did cross one, um, was 0 0.86, which did favor the in-plate arm. And overall, despite this early concern, there was survival, um, and AL, AML rates were quite similar in both arms. So I think the jury's probably still out, but when it was stopped, I think there was a lot of concern for these agents, but they may be looked at a little bit longer going forward. Lots of other agents that's been studied, and as mentioned earlier, we could go through them at length, but just to give you a flavor with these particular agents, all using different uh, mechanisms of action and what kind of responses we're seeing. We don't vary much, no matter what the um, investigational agent is. You'll remember I told you after 2008, lenalidomide, we are quoting between sort of 20 and 30% response rates with anything that we do for these patients. And thus far, any investigational agent that we've looked at is showing the same. So um, SKEO 469, 29% hematologic improvement rates by IWG criteria. ARI 614, again, very similar, about 21% hematologic improvement and the same um, in other drugs that were looked at. And so I think um, we want to do better than this, and that's why with the early look at that loose patterns up data from ASH being over 41%, um, and in the 60% range, if you have a particular set of molecular mutations, that it's possible we can do a little bit better going forward there. So then what about stem cell transplant? You know, some of you are at institutions where um, this is something that's very considered, and I do, I do consider it in lower-risk MDS patients on occasion. I consider it in younger-risk patients, uh, excuse me, younger patients, um, if I think their risk over their lifetime is enough that it's something we really uh, are willing to incur the potential toxicity of, of transplant. Patients who have life-threatening low platelets, I think we really have to think about this uh, sooner rather than later. If ultimately they fell into the old IPSS uh, lower intermediate one, but then I look at their revised IPSS and show that they have an unfavorable score. This is something to think about more likely. And I do, with caution, recognizing that we don't have large amounts of data, but I do do molecular phenotyping of these patients. And if they have some higher risk mutations, something like the TP53, we do talk more about transplant earlier on in our series of discussions. And then certainly if someone has come to me at the time that they've already been through ESA, lenalidomide, perhaps clinical trial, as well as azacitidine, then we have to talk about um, using stem cell transplant at that point in time. So finally, just to review uh, the schematic that I showed you early in the talk, I think there's lots of ways to treat these patients. I highlight on this slide in red clinical trials because I think there are ways that we can help these patients and looking at it in a systematic fashion with newer drugs. Uh, is very reasonable if that's an ability that your patients have to travel to a center or perhaps one of these is open. So in summary, there can be persistent anemia after these ESA failures, and it's a clinical problem that's challenging for us as clinicians and for the patients as they deal with it with their lower risk MDS. The second line therapies really only still are yielding modest responses. I think it's quite reasonable to consider investigational agents as second line before moving to something like um, a hypomethylating agent. 
We've talked about where TPO agonist receptors um, should be considered. And then if all else fails, we do consider um, stem cell transplant. And we talked about the population where that might be earlier in the conversation as opposed to later. So I do appreciate your time, and I'm happy to take any questions.